Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Malik Moaz Abdullah. I am a senior fellow at uh, Muslim Public Affairs Council, and I'm a professor of critical theory and social justice. I'm honored to be here today at the convention with all of you uh, to serve as your moderator for the panel. Again, the title is Religious Thought in the Context of Contemporary Crises. Can you guys hear me? Is the hearing okay? Great. Um, so we're going to start the panel uh, with a series of questions to each of the panelists. And uh, at the end of that set of questions, we'll come out to the audience. If you have any questions you'd like to ask to the panelists, we'll, we'll field those. Um, so in the interest of making our time as effective as possible, um, when you stand up to ask a question, if you could have formulated it ahead of time. Um, so uh, I often find what I want to say while I'm talking, uh, but probably be better if uh, we worked on that before. Um, so, the preliminaries out of the way. I'm honored to introduce you to our esteemed panel here. Uh, the first uh, person, the center, is Niala Mohammed. Niala Mohammed is the director of policy and strategy at MPAC. She previously served as the senior policy analyst at the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, focusing on religious freedom uh, conditions in South Asia. Before her tenure uh, there, she worked as the multimedia broadcast journalist for 14 years with the South and Central Asia Division of Voice of America covering the Afghanistan-Pakistan border region, India, human rights, politics, terrorism, and extremism. Further down is Mustafa Akyol. Uh, uh, Akyol is a senior fellow at the Cato Institute Center for Global Liberty and Prosperity, where he focuses on the intersection of public policy, Islam, and modernity. From 2013 to 2021, Akyol was a contributing opinion writer for the New York Times, covering politics and religion in the Muslim world. He's the author of Reopening Muslim Minds, A Return to Reason, Freedom, and Tolerance, Why as a Muslim I Defend Liberty, The Islamic Jesus, How the King of the Jews Became a Prophet of the Muslims, and Islam Without Extremes, A Muslim Case for Liberty. And second here, last, uh, last but not least, Javad Hashmi, Dr. Javad Hashmi, um, is a practicing physician, former fellow of medical ethics at Harvard Medical School, and a PhD candidate in the study of religion, Islamic studies at Harvard University. Currently, he's completing his doctoral dissertation on the ethics of war and peace in the Quran and during the lifetime of the historical Muhammad. Aside from the intersection of religion and violence, Dr. Hashmi specializes in Quranic studies, early Islamic history, and Islamic modernism. Okay? So thank you all for being here. And... Okay. okay, so I thought we should begin um, with the most pressing issue for so many of us, what's happening in Palestine and Israel today. So I thought that since we're gonna discuss the status and role of religious thought in the context of contemporary crises, we might start it in this way. So you can, um, we'll just go down the line uh, and each person take, a, uh, take an opportunity to answer. So here's the first sort of broad question and then I'll make it a little more specific. You answer however you'd like. Okay. So. The first broad question would be something like, for you, what role uh, does, do the interpretations of uh, religion play in the ongoing crisis and violence in Palestine, Israel? So that's the broad one. Then a bit more specifically, do you think, as is sometimes claimed, that the intertwining of religion and politics necessarily makes compromise and peace impossible? Are there interpretations of religion that do? And I think we should talk about the claims that Islam is uniquely violent. Um, and so, we could start there. Go ahead. Sure. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, so if someone were to ask me, is the Palestine-Israel conflict a religious one, I would answer it's complicated. Um, I think first and foremost, we need to push back against the idea that's very common that this is just Muslims and Jews fighting against each other for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years since time immemorial and thinking of it as a religious issue in that way. So I think a lot of people want to say, who are educated on the issue, that it's not a religious issue, and I think that's correct in uh, a limited way. Um, additionally, uh, Zionism, when it first came out, was uh, led by many secular and liberal Jews, uh, and was opposed by uh, the religious orthodoxy, the, uh, the rabbis. Um, so from that standpoint, it's not a religious issue. Additionally, the Palestinian resistance was uh, formed primarily by nationalists, Palestinian nationalists. Many of them were Christians in, in addition to Muslims. So that's another point in favor of it's not a religious issue. Um, however, I say it's complicated because religion did come into the issue 
at a later point, increasingly, uh, with the rise of religious Zionism, and then on the Palestinian side, of course, with the rise of uh, Islamist parties such as Hamas. So uh, the answer to the question, I think, is it's complicated. I would say it's not primarily or essentially or inherently a religious issue, but neither is it completely divorced from religion and religious interpretation. So that's how I would take a crack at the first part of that question. I just wanted to say my name's Nyla, not Niala. That was a mishap. It's not your fault. It's my dad's fault. He, he spelt my name wrong um, on my birth certificate. So it's Nyla, um, unfortunately. It's my fault. And you told me, and I still messed it up. I apologize. Um, so I've written down my answer. So apologies to, to you if, if I um, read off of my phone. But um, I believe there are several religious factors pertinent to Islam and Judaism that dictate the role of religion as a main factor in this conflict. So notably including the sanctity of holy sites and the apocalyptic narratives both religions have, which are detrimental to any potential for a lasting peace process. Um, extreme religious Zionists in Israel increasingly see themselves as guardians of how the Jewish state should be and are very stringent when it comes to concessions to Arabs and they're openly discriminatory towards Muslims. On the other hand, Islamist groups in Palestine and elsewhere in the Islamic world advocate for the necessity of liberating the holy sites for religious reasons. And sometimes they preach hatred against Israel. However, it's important to understand that this hate doesn't stem from anywhere. Um, these sentiments were born um, or they were cultivated through years of occupation and oppression. And I guess I'll wait for the second half of it. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, and Assalamu Alaikum to all the brothers and sisters. Uh, and thanks to MPEC for inviting me. It's my first time. You know, I have the chance and honor, you know, to be with you here. Mustafa, <laughs> thank you. First, I should say that I'm deeply sad and with the loss of innocent life in the past whole month, especially in Gaza. I mean, thousands of children have been killed by Israeli bombs. There's absolutely no justification you know, for such indiscriminate attacks on a civilian population, to us or to any population. So I should make that clear, and I think that's a huge tragedy. Uh, and we should stand up against that, uh, I think, as, as any good people, any people with a human conscience. I'll add to that. I'm, I was also sad to see the loss of life on the Israeli side, innocent civilians on October 7. Uh, I support the Palestinian cause in, in terms of the Palestinian people's right to have a state of their own, as they, just as Israel has its own, right? I mean, every country, every human being deserves to be free in a state that, ca that can identify with equal rights. But the cause for that, I think, is important, and I think indiscriminate attacks on civilians, that's not what we Muslims do. I mean, that's not what our tradition is. So I think we should be clear on that as well. And uh, actually that was one of the key contributions of Islam to human history. We didn't attack women and children in, in battle. Uh, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, commanded his fighters, you know, fight in the name of God against aggression, against persecution, but do not kill women, children, and the elderly. Uh, do not cut down trees, you know, do not attack monks. Uh, and that's been in our Sharia, in our religious law. And, uh, a lot of Muslims remember Salahuddin Ayyubi, you know, the great commander. There are many things to remember him for, but also he was, he fascinated crusaders at the time that he didn't kill women and children. Crusaders were killing just without indiscriminately. So I think on our side, that's a moral bar that we should always uphold and speak, uh, speak out against groups like Al-Qaeda, which justified this, and now Hamas did that. We should be against that. But then we should be against the people who are unfortunately bombing our civilians today. So that's the, I think, moral position we should hold. Now, is this a religious war? Is this a battle between Jews and Muslims? No, it's not. I mean, it's a, it's a battle over land between Israelis and the Palestinians. It deserves a fair solution, you know, giving security, dignity, freedom to both peoples. And I should say that before this, we were fine with the Jews, I mean, as Muslims. Actually, Jews repeatedly escaped Europe, came to the lens of Islam to find religious freedom. I'm from Istanbul, that's my hometown, so I can say I'm an Ottoman, you know. Uh, 
Ottoman Empire was the best thing Jews had before Israel as a state of terror. Yeah. I mean, Jews were persecuted in Christian Spain. They fled to the Ottoman Empire and Sultan Bayezid, uh, Sultan, uh, not the Bayezid, the eighth Sultan, uh, Bayezid II, welcomed them. And, you know, they settled in Istanbul and they said, I mean, there are recordings saying that this is the best thing that happened to us. I mean, because Europe was, Europe was the persecutor of Jews. And that continued with the Holocaust. And we are with the Jews against that, right? Against Holocaust, all the injustices they have faced in human history or wherever they're facing today. We should be clear about that. We don't have a religious problem. And actually, we are the two closest religion. You know, our practices are similar. We can pray in each other's uh, places of worship. We don't need pork. They don't need pork. You know, well, we are, there's no problem there. It's the problem of this land, and right? I mean, the Palestine. And we need a fair solution to this. And on our job, we should protect our people, stand for them, and we should make sure the cause for Palestine is ethical, right? I mean, and I'm not a Palestinian, I can't stand, but as a Muslim, I can say we should have our own rules of war, which do not target the civilians. So actually, which we can ask the same thing from the other side, which unfortunately is not being followed today. Uh, yeah, so these are some initial thoughts on this question, but we can, of course, continue. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I think that uh, you might answer, each of you answer, uh, uh, some of the more specific questions that were under, you know, that I, that I put underneath the first one. Um, but the first one was like, so secularists, you know, committed secularists will argue that uh, any involvement in religion and politics essentially makes conflicts intractable, right? So um, that's a question if any of you want to take on, I'd be happy to hear your answers to. <clears throat> yeah, sure, thanks. So. I think that's a very popular view, and uh, so it was recently expressed by Sam Harris and Brett Weinstein on the Trigonometry podcast on this issue. Um, I think that's a way and means of saying that this is just those crazy religious fanatics. They're the cause of the intractability of this problem, and so what can we do? I mean, we can't do anything other than, quote unquote, bomb them back into a higher state of rationality. Uh, those are the words of uh, William Kavanaugh, who wrote a very uh, good book called The Myth of Religious Violence, in which he tackles this myth um, that people have, it's very common nowadays, that religion is somehow uh, the cause of all or most violence. Um, and so I think I definitely disagree with, with that viewpoint. Um, the cause, I mean, you can see on both sides, they're religious people and they're secular people, and oftentimes what they're calling for can be very similar, including, for example, between religious Zionists and secular-minded uh, Zionists. Um, but I still think that there is a religious element that needs to be addressed on both sides. I don't think that either side is necessarily irrational or in, you know, it's intractable, but... So, for example, and here's where I was gonna answer one of the other questions, which is, is Islam inherently or, or uniquely violent? I would say we, we all have heard, okay, that Hamas is Islamist and has these viewpoints which make it hard to talk to them about peace. But we really don't talk about on the other side, um, so with the rise of religious Zionism. I, so I study religion and violence, so I look at ethics of war and peace in different religious traditions. And uh, what I've found is that all of them have their warts and bumps. Uh, but for some reason, it's only Islam that really gets that hyper focused in the media, and there are obvious reasons why. But for example, um, some of the things that we're seeing right now, for example, the way the Israeli military is dealing with uh, uh, the civilians in Gaza, actually goes back to certain view, religious views that are expressed in the uh, Jew, religious Zionist tradition, uh, the Jewish tradition on civilians. So if you um, are in any way supportive of or even if you don't actively fight off the quote-unquote terrorists, uh, they can justify saying that you are complicit. Uh, similarly, uh, if you've seen the humanitarian corridor, uh, this idea that we're gonna create a uh, corridor that you can uh, flee from, this is actually also part of uh, that tradition in which there's this idea that you should only attack uh, a city from three sides and leave one side open for the non-combatants to flee. What that actually does is, number one, is it's a military strategy that you have less resistance then. Number two is you want the land, so let people flee. It's an ethnic cleansing. And number three is then whoever is left behind is now morally culpable and no longer an innocent civilian, so now you can kill them. So that, this is very troubling thinking. 
Um, and there is some religious thinking behind this is what I'm trying to say. Now on the flip side, I always want to be balanced and say, and I say this as a Muslim, we have the warts and bumps within our tradition as well. Uh, and so I think we need to be uh, open and critical, uh, self-critical as well. And so for example, on the flip side, you do have Hamas. Now it's, uh, it's false to say that Hamas wants to completely destroy Israel and doesn't want peace at all. We always mention the charter, but Hamas has obviously said things that you know, specialists will say, okay, they, they are inclined towards peace and even the two-state solution. Uh, I personally am a, a big proponent of the one-state solution, but in any case, um, there are religious ideas that are troublesome. So for example, the idea that you can only have a, a peace for 10 years. This is the kind of the way they express that they, they are open to having a peace with Israel renewable, et cetera. But these are ideas that go back to the medieval Islamic tradition. Um, so from this standpoint, what I'm trying to say is that I'm not trying to demonize Judaism or Islam. I'm, I'm, what I'm saying is that we all have things in our, Islam, in our traditions that need to be reassessed and rethought. And that's why I think this panel is a good one to have. I think Muslims need to rethink some things. and I think uh, uh, critical uh, people on the other side need to rethink things as well. So that's where I fall on that issue. Sure, I believe that Western narratives that define Islam as uniquely violent are just that, they're narratives. They're narratives um, used to depict the West as rational, developed, um, superior, and then Islam as, you know, violent, underdeveloped, uh, inferior. And it's quite honestly a narrative that we have to fight against. Uh, remind me the question again. You have, you, have, uh, you have an option. You have an option here. Um, one is, does the uh, a secular critique that any involvement in religion and politics makes it intractable or, okay, yeah. to Rod's point, irrational? The other is the claim that uh, Islam is Got uniquely it. violent. Well, I mean, uh, the secularists who say religion is particularly violent and when we have less religion in the world, everything will be peaceful and nice, I think they missed this thing called the 20th century, I mean, right? I mean, we've seen a post-religious world in which, in which there was World War I, World War II, there was Pol Pot and Stalin and Hitler and Mao and huge destruction and wars in the name of communism and nationalism and any, any ism you, you can think of. So, I mean, human beings fight, unfortunately, and fight in the name of something that they value, right? It could be religion, it could be ethnicity, it could be politics, it could be, they could be football fans killing each other, I mean, who knows. So we should, we should try to be honest about this. Now, this, this doesn't mean that in our religious traditions there might be themes that militant groups use to make things worse, right? I mean, now, if you ask me in the past, in, in, um, in the Ummah, like among us in the Muslim world, uh, we have, a, we have a crisis in the past century, right? I mean, the fall of the Ottoman Empire, colonialization of Muslim lands, uh, rise of authoritarian regimes that oppress uh, you know, Muslim communities. This has all created a trauma and against which some extreme reactions grew as well. And those reactions are wrong and we should address those. But they just didn't come out because people started to read the Quran and find the worst which is about jihad and let's start to go and attack people. No, I mean, they got angry because something happened to them, and then they go and find the relevant verses or pick up something, find a hadith or find a fatwa that can justify their action. And some violent action is justified. If you're attacked, you're all, I mean, you can defend your country. I think everybody can acknowledge that. But you should also have a vision of peace. How do you get there? Uh, so, no, it's not a source of militancy. It doesn't mean that we have people who give fatwa we have people who have given fatwa for suicide bombing. It was wrong, I, sh I think. We have people who have, not here in America, but you know, those people exist. But this is a very, uh, one thing on jihad, you know, in, in the West, jihad has been, oh, it's, it's, it's terrorism. In classical Islam, in, in, until in the pre-modern era, jihad never meant going attacking women and children. Jihad was a battle between armies. Ottomans had jihad, they went all the way to Vienna, tried to conquer it. We couldn't get it, I'm sorry, but yeah. <laughs> I mean, but it was never, I'm, I'm kidding, I wasn't trying to get Vienna, but. 
I mean, it, people, this was an age of empires. Christian came and conquered. Muslims went conquered and just a, that sort of thing. The idea that it can mean terrorism in the modern sense, that you go and attack civilians intentionally, that is like that emerged in the 1970s. Uh, it, it began with the road all the way to Al Qaeda, some militant, takfiri jihadi militant groups, right? So we should reclaim the concept of jihad from these groups that you know attack innocent people and call this jihad. We should, this is not justified. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there are people who say, oh, Palestine difficult situation is very difficult because Hamas is violent. Well, look at the violence on the other side, people who speak of Amalek, right? I mean, uh, Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu referred to Amalek, and that was an unacceptably outrageous code because we know the commandment about the Amalek in the Bible is unacceptably ruthless, right? So, plus, however, we had Palestinian groups led by George Habash, who was a Marxist Christian. So it's, this is a political problem. People may religionize it. From a religious perspective, you can build war or peace as well. We should work on peace. We should stand up against the extremists who use it for further violence. And we should not allow people to say religion is always a problem. If you use it for militancy, it could be, but it can be a part of the solution. Thank you. Um, yes. So, Ms. Mohammed, I thought I'd start with you. You mentioned narratives, and I thought, um, Spia, um, it might be good to have you think about this uh, question. So, keeping uh, with our approach, I wrote this down, it was a complicated question, you'll excuse me. Uh, keeping with our approach to interpretations of religion, I wanted to ask each of you, and I'd like to start with you, uh, in your work, how you address what I'm, I'm referring in my question to the instrumentalization or weaponization of religion, to pick up the themes here, um, to justify oppression and exploitation, and again, to think about it from inside the religious and Muslim community and from outside. And my examples would be, MPAC wrote what I thought was a very powerful statement about um, justifying the morality police in Iran. Um, but then on the other side, for instance, the, the one that you brought up, uh, and I think everyone's brought it up, which is the narrative about Muslims that goes back to what, the ninth century? Uh, uh, and then, of course, got picked up in Western, uh, col the Western colonial project uh, about Islam being an obstacle to civilization and progress as such. So um, what I'm interested in is how you address those kinds of narratives um, inside and outside um, that weaponize religion for oppression. It's a very broad question. You can go wherever you'd like. I'm glad I had time to marinate on this. Um, so. Weaponizing religious freedom issues is a tactic used by both the United States and Muslim majority governments, um, such as Iran, Pakistan, Afghanistan. In America, religious freedom and human rights are selectively used to justify and move forward foreign policy objectives, right? So for example, atrocities towards Uyghur Muslims in China have occurred for years since World War II, but they're highlighted more so because it helps the US in perpetuating the image of the Chinese government as a villain in the global community. Whereas Israel and India are protected despite their human rights track record, particularly towards the treatment of Muslims and other religious minorities. So the selective use of human rights agendas and weaponizing religion is quite problematic. And I'll keep it short. Yeah, so, that's yeah. So I, <clears throat> I absolutely agree that the use is always selective, pointing out human rights abuses in countries that are it's strategic to do that, like China. Um, even coming back to the earlier question uh, about, you know, we can't deal with Hamas because you know they're extremists. This was the same uh, tactic that was used with the Japanese, by the way, at the end of uh, World War II. Uh, the idea was spread that the Japanese, they're religious fanatics, uh, and they will never give up, they will keep fighting, even though we know now that they were sending out feel, peace feelers for a long time, way before the atomic bombs were dropped, and they were turned down by the, uh, by the Americans and the British because they wanted to use, the Americans wanted to use the atomic bombs for whatever reason, including showing the Soviet Union that they had them. Um, so, so this shows that, no, you can uh, negotiate with religious fundamentalists, even extremists, whatever you want to call them, you can. And Hamas has shown that they are willing to uh, negotiate uh, with Israel. Now, personally, I'm obviously not a fan of Hamas. Um, and I think uh, we should point out that uh, 
Israel facilitated the birth and growth of Hamas in the 1980s. Uh, but Benjamin Netanyahu has voice, said that we need to support Hamas uh, to split the Palestinians and to pretend there is no partner for peace. Um, so it's very strategic to do that. But circling back now, because uh, I'm, now I'm rambling, but uh, to circle back to the question about selectivity, I think it's correct and we should point that out. But at the same time, I think we always need to engage in a double critique. Uh, by double critique, I mean, yes, we critique the outsider, which in our case, we're Muslims, so we're talking about the West and uh, the colonial forces. All of us can see that very clearly. But I also think that we need to do an internal critique as well. And so we can't use the shield of their being selective to deny that there are human rights uh, abuses going on in Muslim-majority countries. And that's something that sometimes, that doesn't get the uh, you know, positive response uh, you know, the clapping and the positive responses. <laughs> okay, maybe it does, I don't know. But, I mean, sometimes we don't want to talk about the wrongs that are on our, our side. So, on, from that standpoint, I would just close with, uh, you know, there's a, a hadith attributed to the Prophet in which he, someone asks him, um, or well, he says that, stop the oppressor um, and the oppressed, or help the oppressor and the oppressed. And uh, so someone says, well, it makes sense to help the oppressed, but how should we help the oppressor? And this is help your brother if he is one of these things. Um, and the prophet uh, responds and says, uh, stop them from oppressing. Um, so I think we should be self-critical of our own as well. Mm -hmm. Sure. I agree, uh, I agree with Joat and, and Nayla too. N Nayla? Nayla. Nayla, sorry. I have a sister-in-law whose name is Nayla. It's so Nayla. Just, yeah, sir, Nayla, yeah. Uh, apologies, I'll get her at the end of the panel. So. Inshallah, your sister. And, uh, that should all be pointed at me, by the way. That's my fault. I caught the problem. <laughs> now, we have a difficult task in this day of ours. One is we should stand against the oppression of Muslims from Palestine to Kashmir to Xinjiang or East Turkestan, you know, I would call it, but you know, Chinese call it Xinjiang. And different parts of the world, Muslims, Bosnia, I mean, now it's okay, but in the 90s, they suffered genocide at the hands of vicious, you know, Serbian ultranationalists. Uh, we should defend the oppressed Muslims, but also then we should stand up oppression in the name of Islam, which is also taking place in different parts of the world. Under the Iranian regime, in, in Arab the dictatorships in the Arab world, in Pakistan against minorities, these things are happening. And some of these are political oppressions, some of these are religious freedom, the violations. Yes, the Western governments can be sometimes selective, which, we, which they emphasize or not. That's true, but that doesn't mean religious freedom is not, is a lie or it's not, it is a value. I should say that as a newcomer to America, I'm happy to find it established in America. I think it's a great thing that you, know, you have religious value freedom here. I mean, I think uh, we, we should stand up for the oppressed people in Afghanistan at the hands of the Taliban if they're oppressed, right? So, because ultimately we're standing for principles. Oppression is wrong, we stand for freedom, we stand for justice. Muslims can be on either side of that you know, divide. And in the world today, they can be, I think, on both sides. Okay, okay. so we've got two different um, uh, modes of um, addressing these problems. One is, and you've talked about it quite a bit, which is you have to stand up and fight sometimes in defense. Um, the other is a narrative one. Um, uh, and so you all do this work. You do this kind of um, uh, work of critique, internal critique, um, and um, I think what you might call reform, the, the work of reform. So. I guess I want to uh, ask a couple of questions, but I'm gonna open it up for you all to talk about it uh, however you'd like, uh, in whatever order you'd like. But um, I, I originally asked you how in your work you go about countering those narratives. So I still have that question to you. Like when, and let's think about it in terms of your relationship to the religious tradition, because oftentimes the idea of reform, Islamic reform, especially here in the United States or in a Western context, um, can be seen as uh, some kind of betrayal. So a betrayal of revelation, a betrayal of the tradition, um, a mere adoption of uh, Western liberal norms. So how do you, in your work, in each of you in your work, navigate what I, I read and, and hear in your thought 
um, a, a reformist relationship to the current context and the current narratives uh, without being drawn into or without uh, feeling stuck in, is that possible to not feel stuck in, that dilemma of being seen as uh, somehow in betrayal of. Does that make some sense to you? I'll fix it more. Okay, yeah. Um, okay. Go ahead. What? No. I said fix it Yeah, she like makes more. Okay. So uh, when you're, you did the work, yeah, you, did the, you do this work, you did uh, reporting work and journalist work, um, critical of um, the abuse, the misuse of uh, religious ideas for oppression. Um, when you're doing that, were you accused uh, of somehow uh, betraying uh, religious tradition, not standing up for Muslims, um, uh, being uh, westernized and liberal in your positions? And if no, yes? It works twofold. On okay. one hand, uh, I've been accused of being extremely um, pro-American and pro-government because I worked with the government for 17 years. It's a difficult stance to be in. On the other hand, when you're within the U.S. government and you're working as a Muslim employee, as a federal employee, um, you have to bring up uh, your own perspective, your own narrative, and that's very difficult because a lot of people are not familiar with that narrative. It's not palatable for them. So it is a struggle, for sure. Um, and you get caught between a rock and a hard place. Yes, that's right. That's great. Um, do you want to... Have I asked a specific enough question sure, for you? Sure, yeah, okay. absolutely. Uh, so I think it's uh, incredibly important to be principled, to uh, look at the evidence. So uh, I really enjoyed Mehdi Hassan's talk uh, before. I'm a big fan of Mehdi Hassan. Is he still here somewhere? Um, but he, he, he basically, uh, in his book, he talks about doing your homework. Um, and I think it's important to do your homework and to uh, read both sides, read voraciously. Um, but don't just do it to debunk the other side. Uh, yes, you can do that, um, but learn from, and so in your social media algorithm, make sure that it's, because the way they're built, they just reinforce our viewpoints. And the way human beings are, are designed um, is if there's evidence that goes against what I want to believe, then I ask, do I need to believe this? And then if there's evidence or uh, argument for what I want to believe, then I say, can I believe this? Uh, so it's, must I believe this if I don't want it? And can I believe this, even if it's very weak evidence? Um, so I think we need to fight this part of us. Um, and especially it's based on tribalism, uh, what tribe we belong to. So uh, we want to believe whatever reinforces our tribe and uh, whatever goes against the enemy tribe. Um, so I think we should be principled, uh, not worry about who's doing what, and trying to abstract it out and say, OK, if I was in the, on the other side, what arguments would I come up with? And so I think being principled and not worrying about the response that you're going to get um, from whatever side, I think that's the way to go. Being objective is really important. A principled voices for change. What, what is the? I heard that somewhere. <laughs> it's, it's the name of the conference, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this whole colonialism, Western domination, Russian too, by the way, of course. I mean, this whole our political uh, crisis in the, in the past two centuries developed an attitude in the Ummah to be very defensive about whatever we have in our religious tradition, which is another way of taking them as the guide, right, the other. Like, we will not change anything because they're talking about it, right, I mean. Well, no, we should be self-confident and we should look back at, at ourselves. I think some of our great scholars who lived a thousand years ago who built the Islamic tradition, Imam Abu Hanifa, Ghazali, who knew you, Ibn Rushd, whomever you think about it. If they lived today, they would probably think differently on some issues than what they wrote a thousand years ago as well. So in that sense, I do believe in what you called reform. I mean, that's not our term. I mean, reform is an English term, of course. We, we can call it, I use the word tajdeed, you know, that's renewal. Uh, we need that in our religious tradition. And uh, otherwise, I mean, we end up doing things which are uh, ethically unacceptable and indefensible and, and which is not bringing any good to our religion. Just one example. I mean, what's the classical verdict uh, in, in the Sharia, in our, in our classical jurisprudence on apostasy? You know, Ridda. Uh, whoever, you know, gives up his religion, what do we do with that? Well, all our traditional four schools will say the punishment is death penalty, right? 
It's not in the Quran. There's no basis for that. It comes from one hadith with one narrator. It's doubtable, you know. Uh, there's an endless discussion about which hadith is relevant or not. It's not mutawatir to say it's a hot one. And what Ridda apostasy meant 1,000 years ago, 13 centuries, is very different. It also meant rebellion to the government. So there are scholars today, like Sheikh Rashid Ganushi, who's, by the way, unjustly jailed in the tyrannical regime that has captured Tunisia in the past two years. They said, I mean, we should accept full religious freedom here. I mean, it's, it goes against the Quranic, argue, Quranic verdict, the maxim, like Rafi Din, there is no compulsion in religion. So that is one issue. Or should uh, Muslim sisters, ladies, be able to decide whether they wear hijab or not? Of course they should be able to decide that, not the government. Neither the French government nor the Iranian government, you know? Because it's, it's, yeah, it's between them and God, and we should respect their choices. So, so that we can make the argument that it's her choice, her religious freedom, we should make that argument in Iran, in Afghanistan, in Saudi Arabia, and we should turn to the progressives who want to liberate them from their false consciousness and take them off, which happens in France, unfortunately. So we have issues to rethink, and I think we should rethink them these are all endless questions of scholarship and so on and so forth, without demonizing each other. I mean, me and Jawad have written a lot on these issues of change, renewable reform. Uh, we're not doing this because we are Mossad or CIA spies or something. We're like Muslims who worry about the future of our religion, the state of our ummah today. And uh, other people may have more conservative views. We respect that. We should we be able to respectfully speak about these issues. Okay. Um, I was wondering if, uh, Javad, you wanted to uh, talk a little bit about um, the dilemma of Islamic reform uh, and that problem before we moved on. Sure. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah so uh, October 7th, uh, many people were likening it to 9-11. And there are similarities to what happened in 9-11, both in what happened and then the reaction to it. Uh, but actual, and so a lot of Muslims are like, oh no, this is another 9-11. But to tell you the truth, there was another 9-11 even before that, which was 1857. So in 1857, in British India, there was this uh, rebellion, mutiny, depends on what you call it, of uh, Muslim and Hindu soldiers against the British. And uh, it was put down viciously by the British. There was a lot of slaughter on both sides. Uh, civilians, non-combatants killed on both sides. Um, and the response of the Muslim community in India at that time, there were a lot of similarities to how Muslims responded uh, after 9-11. Um, it caused a lot of reassessment. Um, I still think we haven't really learned the lessons that happened back then. Uh, coming to the issue of reform, uh, so at that time, uh, one of the uh, major leaders, his name was Sayyid Ahmad Khan, uh, prior to 1857, he was writing books on the Ottomans and uh, these, how great the Ottomans were and how great our um, architectural structures are and how great Islam is. And, uh, and then after 1857, all of a sudden, he started reassessing and rethinking certain traditional beliefs and realizing that there are areas where we do need to reform. Uh, he still loved his religion. He, went, he traveled all the way to London, uh, on his own dime, at that time very expensive, uh, to write a biography of the Prophet, to defend the Prophet against what they were writing against. Because at that time, there were other people on the British side who were writing articles just like we have now with think tanks and this sort of thing, explaining how the rebellion was because of their religious thinking, the Islamic religious thinking. And it's because their Prophet was violent and because their religion is violent. Um, so that kind of talk, post 9-11 discourse, it was happening back then. And so uh, Sayyid Ahmad Khan and a bunch of other uh, Islamic thinkers at that time responded to this. Um, and they engaged in what I believe is a double critique. So they pushed back against the British, uh, the, uh, the, the missionaries and the colonial agents who were writing against Islam. But at the same time, they were speaking within their own community and saying there are certain things that we need to reform. So, uh, and this is a very difficult issue. And I know, uh, you, uh, Professor, you deal with uh, uh, you know, decolonial theory and all, all that stuff. So, I mean, there, this is a, a difficult t thing. For example, when the British were trying to justify uh, their uh, imperialism, they can point to certain things, and for example, in Hinduism, there's the idea of sati or white, uh, widow burning. Uh, within uh, Islam, there's 
uh, you know, many things that we all know that they're pointing to that are wrong, and then using those to justify, you know, we need to conquer and reform this issue. So what do, you, what do we do as that as Muslims? On the one hand, there are things that they point to that are problematic. For example, Mustafa mentioned uh, the apostasy punishments. What do we do about that? Do we just say they're weaponizing it and they're being selective? That's true, they are. They're trying to weaponizing and using it in the war on terror. But at the same time, I think we need to be self-critical and say, okay, this is something that we need to rethink. Because quite frankly, we are in the post 9-11 world, we've been complaining about Islamophobia and all this kind of uh, things against our rights. But what about what goes on in Muslim majority countries? So I see some people worrying about Islamophobia in America, Muslims, Pakistanis, and then meanwhile, they're quiet about what happen what's happening to Ahmadis in Pakistan. That's a double standard, that's a hypocrisy. So going back to what I was saying earlier, I think we need to be principled uh, and just talk, think about the principles as opposed to who's doing what. Okay, so we have about, uh, we'd like to preserve maybe, uh, uh, maybe got 10 more minutes uh, up here amongst ourselves before we, we turn to questions. Um, and I guess um, I thought it might be nice to end the panel asking the question, uh, what are the most promising and hopeful um, currents of Islamic thought in, in a broad sense uh, that you see out there that, are, that appeal to you, that you'd like to highlight um, here, you know, in the West, uh, in, in Muslim uh, countries, uh, you know, predominantly Muslim countries, um, just open it like that. Nyala, do you want to start? Nyala. Nyala. <laughs> Nyala, would you Nyla. like to start? Nyla, 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 would Nyla. you like to start? I now have a thing. I'm stuck now. I'll never say it right. I'm going to forget my own name. Dear uh, your sister. Is, yeah, is, Malik. Is Malik asks you a question, Nyla. Um, I just want to piggyback off yeah, of, please. Uh, of this about reform. Um, and I think it's really important that in Islam we endorse critical thinking. Um, Muslims have a duty to actively seek knowledge, uh, engage in research, read extensively, ask questions, ask thought-provoking questions, and to strive to comprehend historical context rather than blindly adhering to faith based off of someone else's interpretation. And it's essential that we embark on a personal journey of understanding and enlightenment, and critical thinking is something that really needs to be encouraged rather than discouraged within the Muslim community. So I think, yes, we really need to be objective. We need to think. Um, and I just wanted to piggyback off of that. But if you'd like me to answer the next question that you put forward, I don't have an answer for as far as hopeful currents of Islamic thought. But what I am hopeful about is Gen Z and Generation Alpha. Um, they're unapologetic. They're unflinching in their identity and belief. They're quick to call out hypocrisy and are critical thinkers. And they, I believe that they are our biggest hope, to be completely honest. And we can see that as an example in this crisis in Gaza right now. Uh, we can see how our youth is battling misinformation and disinformation on social media platforms. And they've literally become the voice for the voiceless. So I see that as that current of hope. Indeed. That's right. That's great. Look, I'd like to come back to, to more of that. Can I mic drop with my name? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Ms. Mohammed, please. Yes, thank you. Um, would you like to answer that question? About good things and bad things in the Ummah Well, today? no, like, enough bad things. Uh, let's talk about enough, some good yeah, things. Good yeah, things. So um, are there thinkers, um, uh, groups who are doing work that you find especially promising or hopeful to get out of some of the dilemmas we talked about this? backlash against reform yeah, rooted yeah, yeah. in a sort yeah. of defensiveness yeah, yeah. Uh, in a post-colonial context? I mean, there are great scholars who do producing work. I mean, I, I read them all the time, right? From Khalid Abu Fadl from here to uh, a lot of sisters who are working on issues of women's rights in Islam to people who work on Islamic theories of human rights. I mean, that's the, that mostly in the academic sphere, mm -hmm. but I think there are important ideas. There's a whole discussion of maqasid, which is, I find very important, the, the intentions of the sharia. I mean, we have these, these commandments of the sharia, but what's the divine intention behind that? And these are ethical principles of protecting religion, life, property, lineage, and, and the intellect. And so there's a whole literature on that, which I, I mean, intellectually, I find very interesting. 
I mean, in terms of Muslim majority countries, well, some are doing better, some are doing worse. I mean, um, the Arab Spring, unfortunately, was a great hope, but it hasn't worked well as we see it, unfortunately. A lot of things, a lot of actors to blame for that. But the, the famous French Revolution ended in bloodshed and Napoleonic Wars and, I mean, Societies don't become a democracy, a peaceful, harm, like a working, functioning liberal order that easily. And I think uh, we should aspire for that. And I think one thing that is important intellectually is what some Turkish theologians say, which I you know, agree with. In religious issues, we should be able to distinguish what is religious and what is historical. We, are, we have unchanging principles of our religion which will be there for eternity, right? We believe in them, we pray five times a day, we, we worship in one God, and these are the fundamentals. On all the mu'amalat, on all the social issues, when you actually go back to a fiqhi issue, when you look at the rationale, oh, it made perfect, perfect sense a thousand years ago in a certain social setting, right? We can bring the intention today and reformulate new approaches to law. So I think that's the cutting edge in religious thought. In terms of our political issues, of course not everything is about religion. We have dictatorships because dictatorships love to be dictatorships. I mean, they, they, they are corrupt and there are people who use them for power and so on and so forth. But we should not give up the dual strategy and dual mission, I would say to stand up for oppressed Muslims and injustices and attacks against Islam while not losing the sight that we have problems within too and we should you know, uh, think on those. We should stand up against Muslims who are oppressors, dictators who are in the, acting in the name of Islam or interpretations of Islam which are unethical. And one guide there I think is we should not defend something that we, we would not want to be done to us, right? So, and if there are things like that in our tradition, which I believe is historical, not the really religious, but we should think about those things. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Um, so, along with uh, what has just been said, so I, I agree, I have a sliver of hope, a uh, sliver of positivity here. Uh, like Mustafa, I agree that it's mostly being done, that kind of cutting edge Islamic thought in the academic space. Uh, one person who's uh, you should read who's popularizing it is on this panel, which is Mustafa Akyal. So please do uh, read his books um, from that standpoint. But I, I, I have to confess that I'm a little bit of a negative Nelly um, in the sense that, so even I disagree with, and I don't know what Gen Z is, or I don't know what age group it is. How do you count that? But, what is Z? Yeah, I'm but, not even there yet. <laughs> we're not there. I think we're boomers, right? <laughs> so. Uh, I, what I see is, unfortunately, I see a bifurcation. So I see people who are becoming very progressive, so they're, they're, they're gonna have the right issues, uh, right views on like Gaza and the Palestinians, but not really in a, talking in a religious way and a religious discourse. And then on the other hand, you have, uh, w w quite frankly, what I see is more fundamentalism. So I see this kind of divide between uh, young Muslims who are progressive, and then on the other hand, who are um, fundamentalist. Um, and not, so we don't have that middle space where people are, uh, you know, pushing ideas in, 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 a, in a good way, um, but not in a, but doing it in a religious way. And that's why I'm going back to what I said about 1857. I think after that, Muslims were doing that. I just don't feel like we're, we're doing that anymore. Um, and I, that's why I think that a panel like this is important, that we actually think about the religious issues, uh, take the texts critically, take our tradition critically, and in a serious way, uh, and, and go forward from there. So. Thank you. Okay. Um, we're going to take some questions from the audience now, and I'm sure you've thought about them well. Um, and hopefully, uh, yes. So please go ahead. Yeah, Assalamu I had a question in reference to, you know, we're talking about the U.S. Or, or this part of the world versus that part of the world. Do you think the foreign policy has any play as, as far as the region is concerned, as far as the Mideast, or if I think of Asia? Do you think foreign policies from the West has anything to do with what's going on in that part of the world? Can you clarify the question just a little bit? To, to whom are you asking? Yeah, I, to anybody that wants to answer. But basically, if I think of like a post-World War II world, right, and the way the, the Mideast region was carved up, who carved it up, uh, and, I, and even when I look at like, you know, like Pakistan or India after 1947, and what that region looks like, and the various actors that have kind of come into play, 
you know, do you think the U.S. or the Western foreign policy has any play uh, as far as discourse in that region? So do I understand you to be asking about the role of Western, we'll call it, foreign policy in creating the tensions that exist today? Yes. It was very much a divide and rule policy, um, particularly when you look at the South Asia region and the Middle East. Um, and it was done so for a reason, I believe. Uh, and it's unfortunate because we're still seeing the situation in South Asia and the Middle East. And it's a mess. And yes, the West had a lot to do with it. They had a large hand in creating that chaos. And unfortunately, they still have a hand in um, maintaining that chaos, if that answers your question. Um, yeah, so I think the answer is an unresounding yes. Um, if, and especially in relation to Islamic thought. So if you actually look, uh, so there's certain academic books on uh, Islamic thought, uh, like liberal Islamic thought, the age of liberal reform, like Albert Harani, I'm not getting the exact title right. But this was up until 1950s and 1960s, uh, Islamic thoughts and Islamic thinkers were very, uh, you know, the, we use the word liberal, I don't mean it in the same way as liberal and conservative in America, but in the sense of kind of enlightened thinking. Um, and all of a sudden, in the last few decades, we've seen a complete reversal. And that's why I'm a little bit of a negative Nelly. Uh, and I think it's foreign policy that has to do with that. Now, we all know about the push, which is if you're conquering, if you're uh, bombing multiple Muslim countries, occupying them, that's going to cause a reaction and a fundamentalism. We all know about that. But what a lot of people don't know about is that there was actually, after World War II, there was a Cold War policy of supporting right-wing Islamism throughout the Islamic world, uh, specifically positing Saudi Arabia as like a Count, uh, as a new caliph, uh, a, 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 you know, a king of the Islamic world uh, to counter na Arab nationalists like Gamal Abdel Nasser in Egypt, etc. Um, so we know about, you know, how they helped transnational jihad in Afghanistan to fight off the Soviets. But this was a huge policy across the Islamic world to support Islamists and even transnational jihad, uh, just like in Israel, how they supported Hamas uh, against the Palestinian uh, liberation so, uh, organization. So... Um, I think the answer is a definite yes. I would agree with uh, all our colleagues here, uh, especially in terms of support for authoritarian regimes in the Middle East that caters to Western interests, that's very clear. Now, some Americans have themselves even acknowledged that over the, I think, few decades. The whole European colonial design over the Middle East, I mean, creation of these kind of states out of, you know, on a, you know, desk with Sykes and Pico, two guys, French and British, so there's a lot to blame. I would only add to that, it's not just the West, add to that Russia and the Soviet Union too, always. Uh, I come from a part of the world, you know, that, that's been colonized by Russia, North Caucasus, you know, my, my, my family, its origins go to Cherkes, that's in the north. Central Asia has been colonized. Afghanistan has been occupied by the Soviet Union. So foreign powers, yes, have done a lot of damage to us. Some of them are Western, some of them are other foreign powers. And China today is certainly persecuting the Uyghurs in a genocidal way. So I totally agree with that. Just one thing I would say, sometimes this is, this fact is used by Putin's advisor or something like that, but we know who they are too, right? We know them from Syria, we know them from Chechnya, we know them from the Balkans. So uh, we should be against any power that is destructive on our world or any, any force in the world. It's not just one, right? Yeah. yeah, very good. Thank you for that, yes. Assalamu alaikum. So I just wanted, to, it's kind of like a follow up to this question actually. So Joe Biden said that if there was no Israel, we would create Israel. And I agree with Naila that, yes, divide, the, the thinking of divide and conquer. So my question is, would it be beneficial to have research studies done, perhaps in a think tank, to substantiate the, that the concept of breaking this area, which was thought of many, many years ago, even at Napoleon's time, that breaking this area, divide and conquer, is not in the best interest or the national interest of the United States or the West? That's my question. Okay, thank you. Yes. Someone want to take a shot at that? I think one of MPAC's main goals when we push foreign policy issues is to reiterate that that is not in the best interest of the United States to 
um, have that type of mentality. It's really in our interest to fight anti-Muslim animus here and anti-Western animus abroad. Um, and by doing so is to kind of create that mindset. And so yes, I mean, that's one of our main goals. Yes, very briefly, okay, hold on. So uh, I'm sorry, briefly. one second. Go, go ahead, go ahead. Just, uh, you need a need, microphone. Do we need a deeper study, like economically, politically? Uh, like, do we need a deeper study to really convince the West, as far as the, not just the administration, but the public, that this is really um, a threat to national security by continuing to support Israel? Can I say as an academic before now that goes, uh, if you all, uh, we all could get together and establish endowed chairs to do that kind of study, that would be outstanding. That'd be the first thing I'd say. Um, because it's, you know, yes. So Give it's not the a, first one. that's right. First one's for Javad. <laughs> okay, Nyla, you were gonna respond. I think encouraging that is good. I believe having the air to listen is also important. Do people actually want that? Do they wanna hear that? And if they do, then yes, there are all these assets, there are all these opportunities available if people are willing to listen. Yeah, thank you. Um, there, yes. Uh, quick comment and a question to uh, Javed. Um, you mentioned that uh, Israel is supporting Hamas. Uh, as a historian, you should not make a blank statement like that. Perhaps they were part of the creation of Hamas but they're definitely not supporting Hamas now. They lost control and Hamas is a, a, a freedom fighter group now. Um, the question that I have for you is, you mentioned that you have seen some fundamentalists coming out during the situation now with the genocide taking place in Gaza. Can you clarify a little bit what kind of fundamentalism that you're seeing? Sure. Um, so to thank you for the question. Um, so for the first part, um, yes, you're right that a when we say that. So actually, Mehdi Hassan has a great uh, video on how Israel helped create Hamas. So I encourage you to watch that. Now, of course, Hamas it, they didn't literally create it in a lab. Uh, it's more like the analogy that I would give is if you have a certain musician or a singer who's unseen, homeless, maybe and then a producer comes and lifts them up and gives them a record label. That's the role of Israel, is the record label creating that. So um, that's uh, what they did with Hamas. Um, and they've had a long-standing policy uh, to uh, split the Palestinians in this way. But they also fight. So there's some years that they support, and then some years we fight. And this is part of the strategy. So you're right, not at all times is, are they supporting Hamas. Um, so that's, that, that's what I would say. And I would talk about, it's not just Hamas, it's in the wider Islamic world is something that I'm concerned about, which is how historically, again, for Cold War policy, but even after a Cold, a Cold War of supporting right-wing Islamism is something that I'm uh, definitely concerned about. Now, as far as uh, the fundamentalism that I was speaking about, that wasn't in relation to the Palestine uh, issue. Uh, that is uh, just in our religious thinking overall. There are definitely certain aspects where I think we've taken steps backward in the last few decades um, compared to where we were even in the 19th, 20th century. Um, we've kind of taken a step backward because uh, many of our uh, American Muslim uh, leaders in Shuyukh, they're being trained in, uh, where they're being trained in the Muslim majority world and the institutions that they're at um, are deeply, deeply conservative um, and they bring that over here. So. Uh, that's just my viewpoint on that, and of course, uh, everyone is open to disagree. Uh, what I would say is what's obvious fundamentalism is, I think, taking texts extremely literalistically. Um, I, I just think I foresee, and this is the sliver of hope that I'm talking about, I think that the reform that Judaism and Christianity went through uh, in the West, I, I think that's around the corner for, for Muslims as well. Assalamu alaikum. Um, this has been amazing. I wanted to kind of just pivot a little bit and get back to that self-critical lens that you brought up, um, Nyla Jawed, Sa Sarah Dean's brother. <laughs> um, I wanted to bring up a topic. I had a beautiful small uh, discussion group, my New Ground cohort. Um, shout out to New Ground. And we were stumped by a question. So that's Muslims and Jews. We were in a small group. Why is the Muslim Ummah collectively 
decades and decades always centered around this conflict so heavily. When, as you mentioned, there's so much uh, oppression going on within our own countries, but we collectively stand for Palestine in a very large way. So to Jews, it seems, and I'm not speaking for all Jews, obviously, but that Muslims hate Jews. So I, I, I was stumped by that question, and I kind of left home thinking about it and asked my own Muslim family, and I didn't really get a clear answer, and I would love to hear what you all thought. Um, Mustafa, would you like to go first? I mean, why Palestinian issue is very central to Muslim consciousness in the modern era? Well, we can't blame the Muslims for that. It's, it's, a, it's a bleeding wound for 70-something years. Uh, the, it's not the only one, of course. I mean, I said from Kashmir to you name it. I mean, there's so many persecutions that has happened. But Palestine is always there. And I think the significance of Jerusalem in it makes it more sacred, too. So that, that's a part of it. And also it has become this kind of clash between the civilizations, right? U.S. is involved, the whole world powers are involved. So for many historical reasons. Why is it so important for America? Ask the evangelicals. I mean, people have some, some connection to that land and the people there. But I, one point you made is, I think, important. We should make sure, and there, there is that problem, that this is not against Jews. This is not even against Israelis. This is just per, against persecution. Here's a people who have not been given land, who have not been given citizenship. They are not the citizens of Israel. They don't have state of their own. They're living under occupation for decades. This is just an unacceptable perse systematic persecution. And, and that persecution has hardened attitudes, created fanatic responses. I, I don't approve anything Hamas does against Israeli civilians. That's absolutely wrong. We should be clear about that in my view. But when you have such persecution, these things happen. So we should also tell it to that those people too. I mean, I'm coming from Turkey. We have this endless Kurdish question, actually much milder compared to the Israeli question. But I always said, I said PKK is terrorist and I'm against that. But hey, we banned their language for 80 de decades. So what were you expecting? So that's what you have to tell them. So I think to be fair, but one thing is that there are people in our communities who have turned this issue into a source of anti-Semitism, into a source of demonizing the Jews. They cherry pick things from the Islamic tradition whose authenticity is dis disputable. There will be a time Muslims will go and hunt the Jews, they will be behind trees, that kind of thing. We should question those things and I think we should not allow that narrative, which is delegitimizing our cause and also only making the other side more staunch. And they're saying it's impossible to make peace with these people they, they want to destroy us. No, we don't. We shouldn't. And we should control the people on our side and speak out against them saying that what you're doing is ethically wrong or what you're saying is wrong. And it's not even helping our cause because we need justice here. We need peace. And for that, we need sanity. Right? Thank you. <clears throat> so I think one of the reasons why the Palestine issue comes first in, uh, you know, f in our forefront is it's the last settler colonial project of the West. And so it has this special place. And uh, so that's number one. Number two is, it is what, the, I mean, it's the number one recipient of foreign aid. It's, we live in the West, we live in the United States, so it is a key issue. Uh, it's not the, some random place in the, in the world. And number three is, it does have an influence in the region, in all, in all of its neighboring Muslim-majority countries, uh, an influence that affects the foreign affairs of, you know, in those uh, regions. So, but I do think the questioner brought up a very good point, which is that we should be equally uh, concerned about when we are the oppressors, and there are many examples of that. So, for example, if you can see the Nakba very clearly and say that there was an ethnic cleansing, which there was, and there's a genocide that's going on now, you should equally be able to say historically that there is a genocide, like the Armenian genocide, and other things, that, genocides that have happened, ethnic cleansing that Muslims have been doing. So I think we should, again, be principled. And that, that makes it very simple if you just be principled. Thank you. Yeah. You, brought, you brought up a really good point, and selective justice is injustice, right? So we have to be conscious as Muslims to make sure that 
when we advocate for Palestinian human rights, we also advocate for Uyghur rights. We advocate for the Rohingya. We advocate for Yemen. We advocate for what's happening in Congo and in Sudan. And we're making sure that we're also vocal about, you know, the the crisis in in with the genocide of Yazidis and and all of that. We need to make sure that we're not selective in our human rights agenda, that we're making sure that we're speaking up about all human rights atrocities, whether they're Muslims or non-Muslims. The main objective for us as Muslims is to promote peace and to stand up against wrong. So it's important that we do so, and we're not just selective in saying, you know, we're going to stick together when it comes to Palestine. We have to stick together when it comes to any form of human rights atrocities. So it is, uh, the, uh, the questions are being run out there. It's 3.07. As I understand it, um, there will be a prayer in the prayer room next door. So I believe we have time for one more question. Is that correct, uh, organizers? Uh, okay. Please, I, I'm not running it, they can run it. We're going to that side. here for a long time. Yes, there's a person here, a person there. Um, I, I guess the panel's willing to stay, we'll keep talking, yes. Yes, so I would like to uh, have you reintroduce the panel. It was an excellent, very educational panel, and uh, I enjoyed it personally. But would you please quickly reintroduce from starting you, from the moderator? Are you trying to get me in trouble right now? <laughs> <laughs> so, Nyla <laughs> Muhammad, <laughs> Javad Hamshi, Hashmi. <laughs> okay, you introduce him. Try me. Uh, yeah. uh, Mustafa Akio. No, all right, I got one right. Um, very good. Did you did you get the names? I got them wrong again. A little bio. Oh, oh my I'll, God! I'll yeah. provide you with the bios. Yeah, I'll just, hand it to you. Yeah, okay. okay? Is that okay? That was please. Here. Yes, please. Hi. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Thank you. Um, there is so much erudition and enlightened thought, particularly about Islam in this panel. And I want to come back to what uh, Jawad said about the shiuch being trained in, their, you know, in very conservative ways of thinking about Islam and thinking about the Sunday schools in the United States. So we have Islamic Sunday schools. And you know, many of them are very conservative. Uh, they, the way they teach the children is in a very, very, it doesn't even fit the lifestyles that we have outside of the Sunday schools. So if you could talk to what you're thinking about, sort of, and uh, uh, all three of you actually, in terms of the roles that Sunday schools can play in, um, in sort of shaping and you know, having a more enlightened or more historically, actually a more historically, um, uh, accurate understanding of what Islam is. I'm new in America, still <laughs> discovering the, its ways and communities. One thing, there will be very, there are very conservative Muslims. There will be, that's wonderful. I respect them, no problem. I mean, we, some people can be so conservative that they can choose to live like the Amish, right? I mean, they can, I have only respect for them. The problem exists when they say, oh, you're kafir, you're murtad, you're this and that, and they kind of de begin to demonize other Muslims. That's the problem we have. I think what, one thing we definitely need is more pluralism within the ummah. Uh, I mean, we had it back then in some sense that there were the Hanafis and the Shafis, and, but now it's more complicated. There's Generation Z, was it the last one? Yeah, yeah. Alpha. Don't forget Alpha. Generation. I mean, there are people who are not that pious, who are a bit less loosely connected, but if we have imams, you'll burn in hell, you, you, the, that, is, that is a problem. So uh, one thing we can learn from the Jewish community, I'll say, is that they have all kinds of it. I mean, from the ultra-Orthodox who live in really incredibly medieval, seven, like medieval Europe sort of life, to the very secular and loosely connected ones, they somehow you know, I'm sure they have disputes within, but it doesn't, we should get rid of this kind of uh, condemnation, heretic, and it's in, on social media it becomes a huge too. We are all Muslims, yeah, in the way we understand. Who will judge us? God will judge us, right? We're doing our best, and please don't judge me, you know, that, that, that's the attitude we need, yeah. All right, Malik, we have to end uh, the panel. Voice of uh, here. So we have a next panel starting at 325. People have to pray Asr as well. So unfortunately, we do have to 
wrap it up now. So I'll let you have the last word. I, thought I was just getting started, but okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, that's it. Thank you to our esteemed panel. They were wonderful. Uh, give them a round of applause. And uh, thank you for your wonderful questions. We're sorry we couldn't get to them. Um, we'll be around, obviously, uh, and we hope to, to talk to you. And I'll provide you with bios if you're still down there. <laughs>